Since its launch over 17 years ago, YouTube has been a staple in our everyday lives. It's become a rich tapestry of human creations, both the highs and the lows. And I know my audience love to linger on the lows. So in this video, we're doing a deep dive into YouTube's most scandalous scandals. We need to do it now while the tea is still warm because these scandals have just been popping up all around us over the past few weeks. So please be sure to follow me on all of my socials, each of which are linked in the description of this video. And with that said, let's get into things. We're going to start out with some more recent breaking stories before we delve into the classics. So what better place to start than Ned Fulmer's cheating scandal? Now here's the thing, I've seen a bit of the Try Guys back in the day and he was my favourite of the four, so I take no pleasure in telling this story. But with that said, if you've somehow been living under a rock and don't know who the Try Guys are, they were perhaps BuzzFeed's most famous employees back in the day, probably their most successful since leaving the site, and their deal was that they would try things out. Even adultery! Even celebrity lingerie? What? Yep, they try things out. From trying to explain RuPaul's Drag Race to straight men, to trying to get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Now, each of the four Try Guys had their own things, their own personalities. For example, here's Zack. He's the small one, and he wears glasses. Eugene, he's the cool, introverted one. Keith, he has a big mouth, and he likes eating. And he also wears glasses. And then there was Ned, whose entire thing was that he was a family man that loved his wife. Apparently not enough to not jam his tongue down his employee's throat, though. Said employee was due to be married, and the two of them were caught out in public, making out and touching each other. This proved the rumours of many Try Guys fans who had been noticing that Ned had recently been edited out of some of the more recent videos, and he, as well as his wife, have since come out with brief statements, with Ned stating that he lost focus and had a consensual workplace relationship, and Ariel saying that she wished for privacy in this tough time. All of this is, again, such a shock considering that for anyone that watches the Try Guys, they have always seen Ned as a fatherly figure, a committed family man, but this is yet another example that goes to show that we really don't know our favourite online creators, that no matter how much we think we might know about them, we're really just lying to ourselves. With that said, I definitely think they should delete the video where the Try Guys try out bridesmaids dresses for Ned's mistress, because that has really not aged well or anything else that's come out of this man's mouth for the past decade for that matter. As of a result of this, the Try Guys have parted ways with Ned, and we're still waiting for a response from the YouTube group. Perhaps by the time this video comes out, we'll have some answers, but as of the 29th of September 2022, when I'm writing this, nothing yet has surfaced. For our second and final very recent story, we have one that's been much more hush around online spaces. It's been somewhat swept under the rug it seems, and a lot of people I know didn't have a clue about this despite the fact that it came out a few weeks ago now. So we need to talk about Dave from Boy In A Band. He's best known for his song back in 2015, Don't Stay In School, which by the way, that title has not aged well whatsoever. But this song brought up some really interesting and well-made points about the modern school system in a hip rap that captured the attention of tens of millions. From there, he grew his YouTube channel, gaining millions of subscribers and collaborating with only the best and most famous content creators in the world. PewDiePie, iDubbbz, Jaden Animations, The Odd Ones Out, huge names. And I hate to break it to you if you don't know this already, I hate to be the guy to say it because I watched a lot of his content in the past, I really enjoyed it too, but some of the accusations that have been levied against him are very, very serious. He hasn't come out to confirm nor deny these stories, actually he's been radio silent on social media for years now, but long story short, a number of women in the double digits apparently who knew him or dated him for various amounts of time, apparently between one to six years, they have all banded together to disclose some of the abuse that they have received at the hands of the former YouTuber. 
They've accused him of physically striking one of his exes, of grooming fans, of encouraging eating disorders, which is ironic because he obviously made Jaden Animation's music video about eating disorders. Which I think I need to pause here and say that while I mentioned that he's collaborated with various huge creators in the past, personally I think it's very unlikely that any of them actually knew about this stuff, because I don't think that a person with an eating disorder for example would willingly make a music video with someone who would actively encourage them. That's all I wanted to say, unpause. So that's where we're at now. I don't think that Boy in a Band will ever come back. These accusations, though believed by the public, will likely never get a response from Dave himself. Who knows if any of his online associates will even address it. As of writing this, none of them have. And yes, another person who we grew up with thinking he was a good guy has turned out to be a twist villain. With the Try Guys and the Boy of the Band stories out of the way, let's move on to some more classic scandals. So this next one is yet another one that I've spoken about in the past, but I want to once again briefly touch on it because it's definitely one of the biggest scandals that YouTube has ever seen, and that's the promotion of gambling to children. Which is bad enough as it is, but it's the promotion of gambling to children to earn fat paychecks. And there are two main examples that I want to talk about, both of them you might have heard of in the past. So the first one dates back to 2016, where huge YouTubers T Martin and Syndicate were found out to have been promoting a CSGO skin gambling site called CSGO Lotto, without disclosing that they actually had skin in the game, being the owner and vice president respectively. Obviously, they were promoting it to try and get money in their pockets. It was extremely shady, to say the least. Years later, yet another duo of money-grubbing mingers decided to try their hand at scamming their child audience, and that was Jake Paul and Rice Gum who promoted Misery Brand, an online loot box that promised the users all of their most vain and consumeristic wet dreams. If you spent a few quid, you could get designer shoes or AirPods or the latest Apple product, whatever the fuck it was. It was sick in a few ways. Firstly, because these guys, once again, were paid to promote this website, and they didn't disclose it. But secondly, because the prizes that were being offered were just the most bland, generic luxury items that child NPCs love to own. Both the CSGO Lotto and the mystery brand scandals were found out, and all four of these men were lambasted by other creators online. So this one's going to hit a bit closer to home. This was all over the news a few years ago here in the UK, and it surrounds YouTuber Jack Maynard, who was kicked off the British reality competition show I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Now, I'm not sure how popular this show is overseas, so I'll give you a short rundown of it. The premise of the show is that the producers handpick a few more than a dozen minor celebrities, most of them are like C tier, but every now and then you'll get someone a bit more famous. And these celebrities will be dropped traditionally in the middle of Australia and they have to go and compete various challenges in order to get food for their camp. As the weeks go by, they'll one by one be voted off by the general audience until one person is crowned king or queen of the jungle. People such as Gino DeCampo, Mo Farah, Caitlyn Jenner, and Gemma Collins have competed. But in 2017, it was about to make history when I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of It invited their first ever online creator onto the show. It was a good idea in theory. It opened up a new young audience to watch the show for them, and as for the creators, they love nothing more than expanding into mainstream media as we've seen in the past few years. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was that while Jack Maynard said before going into the jungle that he wanted to make the internet proud, his tweets from five years prior would cast a cloud of judgement upon online creators. Back in the year 2012, when he was 17 years old, Jack Maynard tweeted out several slurs, and when he was about to go on the show, these resurfaced and it brought up a conversation which has been spoken about many times over the years. These tweets were made when the then 22 year old was just 17, and they were made in a time before the rise of the social justice movement and woke culture. To what extent can you be criticised or deplatformed for something that you did half a decade ago? These tweets cost him a golden opportunity. It's to my understanding that he left the show after just three episodes. Some people thought that the punishment fit the crime, though others were more forgiving of his actions, but what was to be done? Jack Maynard had left the jungle and that was that. 
A very interesting scandal to say the least, but definitely not one that painted online creators in a very positive light. With that said, if any I'm a celebrity producers are watching this video, I'd let it be known that if the paycheck is right, I wouldn't mind going out to Australia and chomping down on a witch grub or a kangaroo penis. Just putting my CV out there for the next series. I really couldn't make this video without the OG scandal, perhaps the most famous of all time, Elsagate. If it's not apparent, I'm not a parent, not yet at least, but I think one of parents' biggest fears would be to find out that their children have been consuming horribly inappropriate content, and in 2016 and 2017, those fears would come true. Because it was in those years that it was discovered that there was this hugely disturbed underbelly of YouTube in which videos that were posing as harmless kids content, including characters such as Elsa, Spider-Man, Mickey Mouse, the Paw Patrol and the Avengers, were actually home to some overtly violent or sexual content. It's hard to show you guys any footage because the platform has basically culled all of said content over the past five years or so. Nor would I even necessarily want to because there were indeed fears that these channels were desensitizing kids or worse yet, traumatizing them. These were characters that kids knew and trusted and they would see them get injured, maimed, kidnapped, abused, tortured, arrested or more generally be put in these graphic situations. It was awful for the children and the parents alike because once the child was trapped in this rabbit hole, autoplay was just going to keep them in there. On top of this, apparently predators would often frequent these videos comment sections, adding yet another chilling layer to the entire ordeal. One of the largest of these channels, Toy Freaks, was owned by a man of the name Greg Chisholm, and after it was deemed that his two daughters had allegedly been put in abusive situations, Chisholm was investigated by the police, and though he would not face any criminal charges, his channel would be deleted at the 8.5 million subscribers mark. By the end of 2017, YouTube had put various actions in place to prevent predators from frequenting these videos, potentially being one of the reasons why you can no longer comment on YouTube kids content in the modern day. Additionally, hundreds of channels were given the axe, and apparently hundreds of thousands of videos deleted. As I said, this would perhaps be YouTube's biggest scandal of all time, but it would not be its last. So this next one wasn't so much of a scandal on YouTube's part, nor was it a scandal on the side of creators, but actually a company whose reputation has been dragged through the mud after accusations of it stealing over $1.7 million from its employees surfaced in January 2019. Of course, I'm talking about Defy Media. So if you haven't heard of this company before, they were originally founded in 1996 under the name Alloy Online. And in 2009, Alloy created a division called Alloy Digital Networks to hold its online properties. This would eventually turn into Defy Media. And the digital network acquired several creators that you might have heard of, the most popular of these being Smosh and Screen Junkies. Now, Defy Media was an MCN, a multi-channel network. If you're unfamiliar with the term, these guys used to be very popular in the early days of YouTube because they were supposed to do a lot more of the businessy parts of creation, such as signing up for brand deals, sorting out copyright issues, and so on and so forth. These responsibilities have since been made essentially obsolete by YouTube's interface and creators understanding the platform more thoroughly. Essentially, in the modern day, and for a while now, these companies have been useless. Ian and Anthony of Smosh sold the company to Defy Media for zero dollars, being promised high amounts of stock in Defy Media when the company went public, which it never did. So Anthony Padilla, the creator of Smosh, was a salaried employee for essentially the entire time of Smosh's existence. Matt Pat of Game Theory made a huge video for his channel, which has since taken in over 8 million views, when he went in on Defy in an emotional and heartfelt speech, saying that himself and 49 other creators got screwed by the company. They were consistently lied to and left out in the dust. It's a video I'd recommend checking out if you're interested in this scandal. These facts I included here were merely the footnotes. But nonetheless, it's very common knowledge at this point, the shady dealings of the formerly huge MCNs that infamously took money from creators without giving almost anything back.
So this next one I wanted to include because I feel as though when it happened, it went a bit under the radar. And it involves my favourite YouTuber in the world, Jake Paul. You guys already know how much I love this guy. I've bought all of his merch. I'm a Jake Pooler. Guilty as charged. But seriously, what did this guy do? Well, if you're like me, you must have missed this one because it was news to me. But in 2019, he apparently threw a drug-filled birthday party for the American rapper designer, in which he invited miners. And no, I don't mean the blue-collar miners that spend their days underground. Jakey over here would never associate with that scum. He would associate with teenage girls when he's way into his 20s, though, because it was reported that nine teenage girls were drugged at his party, signing a disclaimer upon entry. This was leaked by a parent of one of the girls who blasted it on Facebook the next day. Now, believe it or not, I've been to a party or two in my time, and I've met a lot of people who got seriously drunk and woke up the next day thinking that someone put something in their drink, when in actuality, they had just taken five shots in a minute, blacked out, forgot about it, and threw up all over themselves. But, based on just how many teenage girls reported getting spiked, I think it's more fair to say that something iffy was afoot here. On top of that, based on the pictures of this house party, there would have been a ton of people there. Everyone apart from me, apparently. My invite must have been lost in the post or something. But the Facebook statement itself is seriously worrying. This wasn't someone posting it to mainstream media. It was posted to a Facebook group with all of the mums of the local area within it. And according to a report from The Independent, an official complaint was made by a female guest who also suspects that she was drugged at the party very suspicious, but not something I've ever heard before. And since I am Jake Paul's number one fan, I thought that it was strange. This guy's been in hot water before, but I thought I had heard all of his controversies. Apparently not. With recent events on Twitch, it looks like this wouldn't be the last controversial party that online creators would host, but it was surely one of the first. So we're heading back to the mid 2010s to talk about this next story. One that might unlock a small memory within your head. It's the story of Samurai Buyer. So if you don't remember this or need help recalling events, a few years ago in like 2015, 2016 time, there was an unknown businessman known as Misaki who some YouTubers such as I Hear Everything and iDubs and Jaden Animations were approached by. He was representing a company called Samurai Buyer, who were selling authentic Japanese loot boxes to people. So this supposed Japanese man with broken English would send over a box of authentically Japanese goodies to creators who would then review them on video, noting within these videos how funny it was to talk to this guy. A lot of the time these creators would think they were having a laugh at the expense of Misaki, but in reality, it had all been masterminded, and Misaki would get the last laugh. For you see, the quality of the items featured in these YouTubers' videos fluctuated, and there were countless fans who ordered their boxes and claimed that the items within them were damaged or outright broken, if they even came at all or without unexpected charges. And all around, many people thought that this thing was all a giant scam. Additionally, it's been theorised that many of these quirky conversations that he had with creators had been put on, because not only would he change his writing style depending on who he was speaking to, playing it up more edgy for edgy creators and more cutie for tame creators, but having listened to him speak on Skype, he has a much better understanding of English than his emails would have led on. It's therefore thought that the guy behind the emails was a character, a marketing technique to get these creators to plug his work. And then there were the horrible working conditions claimed by someone that was said to have been hired by Masaki, a guy known online as Merriweather, who quit his job to go work for Masaki after iDubs had advertised a position as a social media marketing manager for Masaki's company, Samurai Buyer. It was his dream job, so he quit his job in Scandinavia to go to Japan, but after working for Samurai Buyer for about a year or so, he was fired without any warning. He apparently received extreme ridicule and insults from Misaki and was barely able to get back home. Since then, Merriweather has come out with his experience. And though Samurai Buyer was shut down in 2020, it's hard to not forget the time that this seemingly innocent Japanese man Misaki, with hilarious and wacky broken English, took the whole internet for a ride, one creator at a time. If you want a more thorough explanation of events, The Right Opinion has an hour-long video describing it in much more detail, which I leaned on in research for this portion of my own video. I'd recommend checking that video out, because it's great. This is Austin McBroom. 
and this was his influencer boxing event Social Gloves Battle of the Platforms, which pitted six YouTubers against six TikTokers and proved once and for all almost unanimously that YouTube content creators were the dominant alphas when it came to physicality, thus proving a fact that we knew all along that YouTubers are clearly superior. All would have gone well for McBroom that night. Not only did he win his fight, but his side won overall. But, and this is a huge but, the event lost a ton of money. McBroom had anticipated that it would make hundreds of millions, but after only selling 136,000 subscriptions at between $50 and $90, you can see that even with the most generous estimations, if every one of those subscriptions were bought at the top tier package, which they were not, McBroom would have been way under his estimation of 10 million subscriptions. So some people would have to take a pay cut, and by that I mean they weren't paid at all. Various TikTokers stepped into the ring that night, got their ass clapped by their YouTube counterparts, and got paid squat for it. Creators Nate Wyatt and Taylor Holder reportedly sent out lawsuits against this guy. NBA star James Harden sent out legal papers to him as well, and LiveX Live are trying to get him for $100 million. Other creators that fought such as Deji and Anissa and Gibb were thought to have been paid in advance. Likely seeing this as the farce that it was, they wanted their money up front. Were people just not interested in who would win out of YouTubes versus TikTokers? Were the headlines just not drawing in the big bucks? Was there not enough promotion for the event? Or could it have been a mixture of all of these things? It probably was. Logan Paul has since come out and called many of the business decisions made, quote, fucking stupid, and it's all gone down in infamy for perhaps being the worst YouTube boxing event of all time. Definitely, if there was ever a YouTube-related scandal to be included in this video, this one would absolutely have to be there, so it is. Okay, so that's all we have time for today. If you enjoyed this video, please do subscribe. We're marching on to 100,000 subscribers and I'd love it if you could join me for the ride. Also, be sure to follow me on all of my socials, especially my Twitch. I'll be streaming very, very soon. Just got my capture card today. And aside from that, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next because I'm only 127 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.